Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Ava Kariwada. I'm one of the internal medicine chief residents this academic year. Welcome to Grand Rounds this Thursday morning. Uh, this morning, we have Dr. Susan Reeds here with us. Dr. Susan Reeds is assistant professor of medicine in the division of geriatrics and nutritional science here at WashU School of Medicine. She focuses her practice on treatment of obesity and associated com comorbidities. Dr. Reeds' practice is based on treating obesity as a chronic illness, addressing the underlying contributors and utilizing lifestyle modification as well as pharmacotherapy. She is the medical director of the weight management program where she works with the surgical and endoscopic weight loss programs to facilitate comprehensive care. Thank you so much for being here to discuss obesity, a patient-centered approach this morning. Thank you, and thank you for asking me to be here today. I will be uh, speaking to you about obesity, obviously. I have no pertinent disclosures to make. My objective today is really to um, provide a, an overview of a practical current approach to treating patients with obesity. Um, I will be focusing on appropriate use of medications and then Towards the end, we'll also review the available resources and programs available at the university. I'm going to start out with a case presentation of a patient that I've been following in clinic for a couple of years now. This was a 45-year-old gentleman when I first saw him and was referred for weight regain following bariatric surgery. And some of the key points from his history, you can see he struggled with his weight for most of his life, um, quite heavy at the end of high school, gained weight as many of us do during college. He had reached a maximum weight of 450 pounds um, in his mid to late twenties, but um, was able to lose hundred pounds on his own. He subsequently um, was evaluated and had a laparoscopic adjustable band when he was 32. And he was about 340 pounds before that, had a fairly good weight loss with that, however, regained the weight almost immediately. And then two years later, he presented for consideration of a revision and for conversion to a gastric bypass surgery. He was about 340 pounds prior to that and was able to lose about 72 pounds, so a fairly good response, and gained about 10 or 15 pounds after that, but then was able to maintain about a 60 pound weight loss for about six years um, until he started to regain again in the setting of multiple life stressors. So he was uh, caring for an ill parent and also working full time while working on his master's. At the time I saw him, he weighed 350 pounds and had a body mass index of uh, just about 52. Some of the key principles to remember in obesity care is um, we know now and that obesity is a chronic illness, um, even though it was only recognized as such um, by the American Medical Association in 2013. It is a chronic illness and it is heterogeneous. So there are many, many things that contribute to it and really no two patients are the same. Before I get further into the approach to the patient, I just wanted to um, bring up a slide about physician attitude. So we know that in society, there is still significant um, obesity um, bias and it seems like obesity is the one thing that it's still quote unquote okay to um, joke about and so forth. But studies have shown that uh, patients with obesity um, are less likely to develop a strong uh, uh, rapport or bond with their primary care physicians. And because of this, they often are less likely to uh, seek out routine exams and screenings. A study from Johns Hopkins showed that um, with every uh, 10 unit higher BMI, that was associated with a 14% higher incidence of lack of patient respect. And finally, the last study here, you can see the attitudes that many physicians had towards um, patients with obesity. And also in that study, they showed that the, the bulk of physicians in that study who were primary care physicians really viewed obesity mostly as a behavioral problem. 
and I was looking for some possibly some more recent references for this just to uh, confirm that these attitudes still exist and I see them I know that they do and just recently though I received an email from one of those uh, sort of medical news sites and it uh, opened up with a cartoon um, basically poking fun at an obese patient and blaming him so it's still out there Some of the key points as you um, approach the patient in their history are, we wanna know about the age and stage of the weight gain and the pattern of weight gain. In particular, if someone has had a history of um, rapid weight gain and severe obesity at a very young age, that might point you in the direction of one of the genetic disorders of obesity. Um, it's important to elicit history of trauma or abuse. This is incredibly common in patients with obesity and really needs to be addressed if they're going to be successful with weight loss. Another important thing is to, um, again, look at their history of weight loss and um, take into account not only where the patient is now, but where they're coming from. So my patient that I mentioned um, when he initially came in to be evaluated for the lap bands, you may see a 300 pound man, um, but more importantly, you should see a 300 pound man or 300 plus pound man who's managed to lose 100 pounds on his own prior to that. Um, another important thing is to look at, and this is often overlooked, to look at uh, medications that may be contributing to the patient's obesity. In particular, the biggest players are some of the psychiatric medications, so the atypical antipsychotics, SSRIs, um, also some seizure medications, and also uh, diabetes medications. And then also very important to look at um, other underlying conditions that may be treatable and may be contributing to their uh, weight issues, um, including things like sleep apnea, insulin resistance, Looking at a little additional history on my patient, when I, at his first visit, he let me know that he had been told about two years prior that he had been, uh, that he was considered pre-diabetic and he had a recent hemoglobin A1C of 5.9 and states that he was just instructed to work on diet, exercise, and try to lose weight. Um, he also told me that uh, we reviewed his medications, include, which included several that might be contributing to his weight, particularly the quetiapine, also the sertraline. It is important when looking at these things, I never jump in and stop somebody's psychiatric medications. I always discuss with their psychiatrist to see if um, alternatives might be possible. Another important thing is to consider eating disorders. And this is something we don't always necessarily think of in association with obesity. And I know that I probably didn't when I did primary care in the past, but binge eating disorder um, with a prevalence of one to 3% pop percent in the general population is the most common eating disorder in the United States. And it's been estimated that up to 30% of patients seeking treatment for obesity have disordered eating. Um, and that number is actually higher in patients who are presenting to have bariatric surgery. It's important to know that um, if you don't ask about these things, you may not find out. So some of the behaviors associated with binge eating um, and one of the characteristic features are that patients are embarrassed by it. And so these are things that they may not say to you, um, they may not tell you that on their way home from work, they go to the drive-thru and get some dinner and then go to a second drive-thru and then come home and eat dinner. They may not describe these behaviors because they're embarrassed of it. So it's important that you seek that out. Um, night eating disorder is um, related to that, um, has some, some differences there. And then um, there's also something called compulsive overeating, which is has some overlap with binge eating disorder. However, it's really defined as having episodes of, of overeating or uh, binging in the setting of a particular trigger. So having a bad day at work, being overtired and things like that. Um, it's important to acknowledge these things though, because um, 
there are ways that we can treat these successfully and the presence of these will often lead you down a different pathway um, in the management of the patient. This patient, when I discussed with him, he did disclose his binge eating history and it's important to know he did have um, a more significant history prior to his bariatric surgeries However, even though it is physically harder to binge after having bariatric surgery, the behaviors are still there and can manifest in other ways. And this patient, um, we began treatment for binge eating uh, with medication and therapy and came back and reported that it was life-changing for him. When you're first um, evaluating a patient and trying to come up with a plan for weight loss, a lot of patients will come in and they're, you know, one of their first questions is, okay, what's, what's my normal weight that I should get to, or how many pounds do I need to lose? And typically I don't give people those numbers. And the reason is we know that a sustained weight loss of even 5% can lead to clinically significant reductions, for instance, in cardiovascular disease risk factors. And if you have a patient who at their initial presentation for example, weighs 300 pounds, and you tell them that they need to lose over 100 pounds, that's overwhelming for them and frankly kind of depressing. And so what I prefer to do is say, hey, if you lose 15, just 15 pounds, which would be 5%, that's going to give you significant health benefits, and that's our initial goal. Overall, we do um, aim for um, a rate of loss of about one to two pounds per week, and it's important to remember that a sustained weight loss of 15% um, should be viewed as a success, even if this does not mean we've reached a normal BMI or an I quote unquote ideal weight. Looking a little bit more at the health benefits of weight loss, we know um, from a study done here in Dr. Klein's group that um, a 5% weight loss can result in significant improvements in a number of uh, metabolic and cardiovascular disease risk factors. As seen here, the uh, diabetes uh, prevention program studies show that a 5 to 7% weight loss can prevent or delay the development of diabetes. That's a big one that is often um, a good target with your patients. So Nobody really comes in and sees me and says, I'd really like to improve my, you know, intra-abdominal fat or things like that. Um, but if you can attach it to something more tangible, that's very beneficial. So some patients have had family members with diabetes who've had required amputations or things like that, and they don't want that to happen. Also linking it to specific symptoms that they have. So letting them know that if they lose even 5% of their weight, they might see a significant improvement in their arthritis symptoms. Or if they lose 8% of their weight, they may have uh, a significant reduction in episodes of incontinence. When we look at treatment, um, it's broken down into mainly three areas. So therapeutic lifestyle changes, diet, exercise, behavior modification, medications, and then uh, interventional surgical and endoscopic procedures. When looking at diet, we know that energy deficit is required for weight loss. So as we said, there are lots and lots of things on many different levels, internally, externally, hormonally, mentally, that contribute to overweight and obesity. But at the most basic level, we know that energy deficit is required to lose weight. And I find that it is nice to be able to calculate, um, I will usually calculate a resting metabolic rate and total energy expenditure. I think patients appreciate having a, a number and sort of knowing that there's a reason behind the number you throw out to them. Um, it's nice that within EPIC, um, under the Nutrition and Diabetes Care tab, you can have all of this calculated for you. Um, it is important to remember, though, that these numbers are, um, under the best of circumstances, they are still not perfect. The Mifflin uh, St. Juris felt to be the most um, appropriate in patients with overweight and obesity, but even that can be um, significantly um, imprecise in up to a quarter of individuals. 
Again, as far as diet, it's, it's the calories and macronutrient content is less important. So the Obesity Society, the American Heart Association and the American uh, College of Cardiology put out um, guidelines for the management of obesity. And they make a point of noticing that all of these diets mentioned here, as well as a long list of others all promote similar weight loss in the setting of a calorie deficit. And so probably the most important thing is looking at something that the patient is going to be able to adhere to. Just looking at this in a different way, again, a study from uh, Dr. Klein's lab here, this compared a traditional uh, low fat, low calorie Weight Watchers type diet with a uh, low carbohydrate ketogenic type diet. And the finding was that after 24 months, weight loss was uh, remained similar between the two groups and metabolic parameters also were similar. I wanna briefly mention intermittent fasting. This has been sort of a, a big topic lately. A lot of people are talking about this and a lot of people have read uh, Jason Fung's book, The Obesity Code, there's three main patterns that people talk about when they are doing, uh, talking about intermittent fasting. Most commonly is probably um, what we refer to as time-restricted eating, where you limit your eating during the day to anywhere from a four to eight or maybe 10 hour window. There is a five two intermittent fasting pattern where two days, two non-consecutive days out of the week, you significantly reduce your caloric intake um, to about five or 600 calories. And then the other days you can eat quote unquote normally, obviously doesn't mean you go to town on those days. Um, and then there's um, alternate day fasting or, or modified alternate day fasting where every other day you either do a full fast or um, strictly limit your calories down to about 25% of energy requirements. Overall, these plans, the data in humans so far suggests that um, these are mainly useful as ways to reduce your energy intake. Um, so there was a study here done a couple of years ago looking at um, alternate day fasting, where on fast days, the participants uh, consume 25% of their um, estimated daily energy requirement. And on the quote unquote feast days, they consumed 125%. Um, and they compared that to people who were um, doing what we call continuous energy restriction. So they were attempting to limit their daily intake to about 75% of required calories on a daily basis. And as you can see from the graph here, weight loss was similar between the two groups. Additional um, data from the study, they looked at plasma glucose levels, fasting insulin levels, um, cholesterol, um, no significant changes with any of those other than a small but um, significant increase in um, LDL cholesterol in the alternate day fasting group. There were also no significant uh, differences in body composition or in uh, parameters like blood pressure and heart rate. More recently, um, a study came out that got a lot of attention um, was the um, TREAT study looking at time-restricted eating versus consistent meal timing or the traditional three meals a day plus snacks. And what they found in this study that they, the two groups were the one group was to instructed to eat the normal three meals a day plus snacks. The time restricted group was instructed to limit their eating to between the hours of noon and 8 p.m. And what they found again was no significant difference in weight loss between the groups and no significant differences in any of these other metabolic and cardiovascular parameters. It is um, somewhat important to note that there have been lots of a large number of studies in animals that do show significant improvements, at least in metabolic parameters with time-restricted eating and intermittent fasting. So far, the studies in humans are 
either they're lacking, they are uh, limited by small numbers, and the pool of evidence is limited by uh, differences in the fasting uh, procedures used. Um, there has been, interestingly, some evidence that in men who are at risk for diabetes, there may be a benefit to what they call early time restricted eating. Um, and what that means is you start your um, eight hour eating period when you get up in the morning and then you um, stop in the afternoon and will not have a, a traditional dinner. And there have been, again, some studies showing that that may be beneficial. However, um, and the reason they didn't use that plan in this study is that socially that's more difficult. It's a lot easier to get up and not eat breakfast when you're busy in the morning and preoccupied with other things than it is to um, skip dinner after a long day of work and when you come home to your family. Looking at exercise, the key points that I wanted to make are that um, exercise does play a role in weight loss, um, a significant, although small role. And one of the key points is that for most patients, um, they are not going to lose weight by exercise alone. We do know that it, exercise is very uh, important longer term in different studies as far as weight maintenance um, and obviously has other health benefits to it. Um, and when we talk about this, it needs to be aerobic exercise. Um, resistance exercise does not result in significant weight loss, although it may uh, contribute to improvements in increased fat loss and increased fat-free mass. One of the most important things here is that, and I know I did this as primary care, we'll often tell people to get more exercise. And again, while this is important, it's important to recognize that a lot of these individuals may never have exercised before. They may have physical issues either, you know, such as pain that are limiting their ability to exercise. And so I quite often will um, recommend a evaluation by physical therapy to help them assess um, how to safely start um, increasing their activity. As far as behavior modification goes, the main points I wanna make here are that um, it's really important to look at all sides of things and consider things as, you know, especially outside triggers, um, the effects that people, you know, other people have as far as being, you know, intentionally or unintentionally sabotaging. Um, the main points I wanna make are that I, whenever possible, I do try to send people to a, um, have them enroll in a comprehensive weight loss program or um, follow up with a therapist who has expertise in the area of uh, weight and eating issues. One point is um, when it comes to self-monitoring, there's debate about this and about the benefits of it. And in general, we know that food diaries, even if you're using one of the apps out there on your phone, food diaries are um, inaccurate at best. Um, but they do help with, in my experience, and I have patients tell me this, that they help maintain accountability and just can increase awareness. When looking at all of the different things that can contribute to obesity and all of the things that need to be addressed in order to successfully manage it, it can be overwhelming both to the patient as well as to the provider. And I'm lucky in the sense that when a patient comes to see me, they already know that we're gonna be talking about their weight. So I don't have to take the step of broaching the topic. And also I have a lot more time to focus strictly on their weight. Some of the things you can do in primary care are to, rather than giving sort of a non-specific goal of um, trying to get more exercise and you know, reduce your portions, set specific goals, smart goals, like we talk about. And so as an example, um, rather than saying, increase your exercise, make a specific plan. Okay, two days a week, I'm gonna get out and walk for 15 minutes or 10 minutes or five minutes, depending on their you know, current abilities. 
um, but a very specific doable goal. And then you can check on that at the next visit. Another goal might be if someone reports that they, you know, have are going to the drive through several days a week, um, make a goal that you're going to limit fast food to no more than one or two days a week. As far as use of medications for weight loss, we know that they are underutilized. I certainly underutilized them when I was a primary care physician. You can see here from with data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey that we know we have over 30% of the, over a third of the United States population um, qualify as having obesity, which is roughly 85 million people. However, one review that looked at prescriptions for uh, anti-obesity medications showed that only 2.74 million people were taking these medications. Um, that data is a little bit old, so numbers are probably improved, but still there's a lot of room for improvement here. In general, indications for use of medications are a body mass index greater than 30 kilograms per meter squared or greater than 27 with a comorbidity um, and always diet, exercise and other behavioral modifications need to be in place. This shows the timeline of FDA approval of various weight loss medications. The ones that are grayed out on here are ones that have been uh, removed from the market for various reasons. Most recently, um, Warfacerin for the increased cancer risk. What I think is especially interesting on this slide is that you can see that after Orlistat came out in 1999 and between that and 2012, there was a long gap there where we had no new developments, but in just the past five to 10 years, um, it's a completely different landscape as far as what we have available. The sympathomimetic medications, so phentermine, phentametrazine, diethylpropion, these are the oldest um, or the oldest medications available. Phentermine remains the most commonly prescribed weight loss medication. These drugs exert their effect by stimulating norepinephrine release in the hypothalamus and also reducing uh, norepinephrine reuptake from synapses. Um, they're very effective in some of the way back when the initial studies of Phentermine 12 week weight loss was in the 16 to 18 pound range. The two important points I want to make um, in particular today are that um, number one, phentermine is currently, any of the stimulants are currently only indicated for short-term uh, 12 weeks of treatment. And that is because the initial treatment studies from back in, um, when it first came out, only lasted for 12 weeks. Um, but recently, um, this study came out uh, about two years ago which was a retrospective chart review study looking at people who had taken metformin long-term, um, either by patients and physicians, you know, uh, bending the rules a little bit. Um, and what they found was that over the long-term, phentermine remained an effective treatment and there was not any significant increase in cardiovascular disease events and also no uh, clinically significant um, alterations in blood pressure or heart rate. Um, the other thing, I think people often worry about the abuse potential of um, any of the um, stimulant type medications. And there was a study from that came out about six years ago that did show that um, with phentermine, abuse and psychologic dependence did not occur in patients who were treated for obesity. Next, we have Orlistat um, available as over the counter as Ally or prescription as Xenical. This differs from most of the other medications used for weight loss in that it is does not affect appetite or, and satiety. Rather, it is a pancreatic lipase inhibitor and it blocks the absorption of fat in the small intestine. As you can see from the um, graph here, it is um, fairly effective, however, uh, most of us are probably aware that it is associated with um, significant side effects, which are quite frequently limited to use. 
it is important to remember if you um, do use um, either of these medications that um, you need to be careful and watch for deficiencies in fat soluble vitamins um, A, D, E, and K. Next, we have the combination uh, medication of phentyramine plus topiramate um, or Qsimia. And we talked about the phentyramine side of things. Topiramate, um, it was found that, you know, this is an anti-seizure medication and now mostly used for different kinds of chronic pain. And what they found was that people who took it for those reasons often lost weight almost as a, as a side effect. So now we use it to help with weight loss. And we think that it's, there's a variety of possible mechanisms. We think that um, most of its actions are um, related to some of the uh, GABAergic pathways in the hypothalamus. Um, the combination is very effective, as you can see here. Some of the most important things to remember with it are that um, with the addition of the topiramate, you have some additional side effects beyond those possible with the phentermine. And in particular, um, the most common thing people describe is sort of a confusion or, or fogginess type thing. Um, paresthesia, so numbness in their hands or feet is fairly common. Topiramate cannot be used if there's a history of acute angle closure of glaucoma. And it's also important to remember that um, the topiramate does have some carbonic anhydrase activity. And so it, it has been associated with metabolic acidosis and an increased risk of kidney stones. Perhaps most importantly, um, the uh, Qsimia and actually topiramate alone are contraindicated in pregnancy um, due to an increased risk for um, cleft palate and related conditions. So for the combination medication, the, you're supposed to uh, check a pregnancy test before in women of childbearing age, check a pregnancy test before starting the medication and monthly thereafter, or otherwise document why they are not at risk for pregnancy. Next, we have the combination of naltrexone and bupropion, uh, the brand name Contrave. So bupropion works predominantly through some of the dopamine pathways in the so-called pleasure and reward system. Um, and so it's very effective on sort of the non-hunger side of things for cravings and, and things like that. Um, it also has some uh, chemical relation to amphetamine. So there is some direct appetite suppression with it. Now, trexone, um, we think it exerts its effect on some of the POMC neurons in the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus to directly reduce appetite. Now, trexone also has a nonspecific um, opioid blockade, blockage of um, opioid receptors, and so it um, blocks endogenous opioids, and that can be very helpful in managing cravings. Again, you can see here it's quite effective. Um, in one of the studies, average weight loss at um, just about a year was um, just under 18 pounds. Um, another study showed that combined over a similar period, combined with therapeutic lifestyle changes, weight loss was on the order of uh, 9 to 10%. The main things to remember as far as tolerance and so forth here, um, or side effects, Main side effects are GI related with nausea being the most common and that can be fairly significant. Um, also with the bupropion, you can see bupropion lower, it can lower the seizure threshold. It's a very low risk at the doses of bupropion that we would be using here, um, less than 1%, but we always ask people about any um, history of other previous seizures or predisposing factors to having seizures. Also with the combination, um, there can be an increase in uh, blood pressure and heart rate, and um, you may see an attenuation of the blood pressure um, improvements expected with weight loss. Lastly, with naltrexone, um, obviously you have to take into account um, if your patients are using chronic um, opiates for pain, um, using the naltrexone can precipitate withdrawal. And you also need to remember that um, naltrexone will need to be discontinued if the patient is anticipating having any surgery where um, 
use of narcotic pain medications is expected. The last new medication on the um, list there, and perhaps the, the one that's sort of been most exciting in management of obesity is um, liraglutide um, or Sixenda. Um, there's a, a three milligram dose of liraglutide, which is indicated only for weight loss. You can see here um, that GLP-1 has a variety of effects throughout the body. The main effects related to weight are that it, number one, can improve insulin sensitivity. Number two, it slows gastric emptying, which can improve satiety and also um, help so that you don't get as rapid and high a spike in blood sugar after eating. And then lastly, um, it has direct effects on the brain to reduce appetite. You can see here that right, liraglutide is um, very effective. Um, in one of the studies, 26% uh, of the treated patients um, had achieved clinically meaningful weight loss at one year and maintained out to three years. The important things to remember, it's, these are usually fairly well tolerated. Um, main potential side effect is nausea, sometimes constipation. There has been an association with pancreatitis. And lastly, there is the risk for uh, increased risk for medullary thyroid carcinoma. This is something that has only happened so far in mice. And it, so we only really worry about it if the patient or someone in the family has had a history of a medullary thyroid carcinoma or if there's a family history of um, MEN2 syndrome. It can be used in patients who have had um, other forms of thyroid cancer. This is just a graphic comparison of the currently available FDA approved weight loss medications. And you can see that Phentermine and the phentermine containing combinations are still our most effective, but we also see good results with the um, liraglutide and the naltrexone bupropion combination. For a variety of reasons, we're often forced to turn to medications which are not officially FDA approved for weight loss. In some cases, this may be using um, individual components of a combination medication alone, such as using bupropion alone or bupropion and naltrexone prescribed individually. Most often this is because it's not covered by insurance. It may also be if there's a contraindication to one or another of the components. Similarly, we frequently will use topiramate alone and Sometimes that will be because it's not covered. Um, more often due to concerns about potential side effects with phentermine, there is good, it's, although it's off label, there is good evidence um, for topiramate. And I find it uh, particularly effective in helping with, again, sort of the non-hunger eating and uh, you know, for cravings or people who come in and say they do fine all day and really struggle in the evenings with cravings and boredom eating. Zonisamide, similar to Topiramate, the important things to remember with both of those is that they are um, contraindicated in pregnancy. Both can be associated with an increased risk of kidney stones. Um, some of the um, diabetes medications, um, particularly metformin, I use a lot of metformin. Um, not surprisingly, a good proportion of my patients have insulin resistance, but I use a lot of metformin. Um, um, also some evidence for the SGLT2 inhibitors and the other uh, GLP-1 agonists. Currently, um, as far as the available GLP-1 agonists, we have, um, again, Sixenda, which is liraglutide 3 milligrams, which is only indicated for treating obesity. And unfortunately, that is not covered by the majority of insurance plans, and it costs $1,200 a month when it's not covered. So that can be a significant limiting factor. The other um, GLP-1 analogs are also effective for weight loss. And you can see here a comparison of the expected weight loss with the currently available um, agents that are approved for diabetes. And you can see currently that uh, 
once weekly subcutaneous semaglutide at one milligram is the most effective. That's um, Ozempic. And, but recently there were some higher doses of dulaglutide or Trulicity that came out with an indication for diabetes that have, um, are significantly more effective. As far as these agents go, if you had asked me six months ago, I would have said that at least 95 plus percent of the time I was able to get one of these medications covered in the setting of either metabolic syndrome, elevated fasting glucose, history of polycystic ovary, those sorts of things. Over the past six months, and um, in particular since the beginning of the year, it has been getting increasingly difficult to get these covered for reasons um, other than a diagnosis of diabetes. An interesting development recently that's very promising and a lot of people may have heard about, um, it got a lot of coverage in the media, was a um, study looking at weekly semaglutide at a 2.4 milligram dose for weight loss. And in this study, over 68 weeks, average weight loss was just about 15% in the treatment group. Um, so this is um, very promising. The 2.4 milligram dose, um, it's currently not FDA approved. They're in the process of trying to get that. It will likely be, it's going to be marketed under a different name so it will, uh, than Ozempic, and it, it will be indicated only for weight loss. So unfortunately, then we're probably going to end up dealing with a lot of the similar restrictions that we have with Sixenda. There is also um, in the pipeline a higher dose semaglutide under Ozempic of two milligrams that will be indicated for diabetes. So that will be helpful as well. An interesting uh, new development, and this is technically not a medication, it's actually a medical device, um, but plenity or jealousis. Um, and what this is basically, um, these are capsules containing a supersorbent hydrogel particles. And you take these capsules before a meal, they expand in the stomach to promote satiety. Um, and you can see results as far as weight loss goes. Average weight loss at 24 weeks was 10% um, or about 22 pounds. Plenity was generally well tolerated other than not surprisingly some GI side effects. Currently, um, it is only available on a limited release basis through their website, myplenity.com, through their physicians, but it is anticipated that it will be more widely available later this year. Next, another exciting development um, is setmelanotide, so a melanocortin-4 receptor agonist. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. We don't, this is... Um, indicated for treatment of some of the um, genetic, rare genetic disorders um, causing obesity and do occasionally see these in um, adult practice or have an opportunity to diagnose them in adult practice. You can see here very effective from a weight standpoint and also um, very effective at reduced appetite and uh, reduced hunger. This is given as a um, daily subcutaneous injection and is indicated in patients uh, six and up. Currently right now it is um, available by completing a uh, form at their, a request form on their site and submitting it that way um, only through certain pharmacies. Some general guidelines regarding um, use of medications is when medication is um, initiated, recommendation is to evaluate patients monthly for the first three months. And after that, um, at least every three months. Success is considered a 5% total body weight loss at three months. And so if at three months there has been a less than 5% loss at the maximum um, recommended or maximum tolerated dose, um, you should discontinue the medication. Um, this is not officially FDA approved, but I approach obesity like hypertension in that you should consider using combination therapy with potentially using two drugs that are working through different pathways. So in 
the patient that I mentioned uh, previously, after initially um, seeing him, he was lucky enough that his insurance um, covered Sixenda. So he was taking Sixenda. And then we had also started uh, medication for his uh, binge eating. We started um, Listexamphetamine for that. And over the course of about a year and a half, he was able to lose 60 pounds. Recently, he came back and with being home during COVID and some other life stressors was starting to struggle again and um, particularly having some a lot of cravings when he was around the house all day. And we've been able to successfully uh, control that with using uh, zonisamide um, that he did not tolerate to a um, the other thing is to recognize that um, currently the recommendation is that th as this is a chronic illness, if the medication is effective and well tolerated, you should think about considering it long term. I want to briefly mention um, indications for uh, referral to bariatric surgery in general. Um, a BMI of greater than 40 kilograms per meter squared or um, above 35 with significant comorbidity. These numbers are lower for laparoscopic adjustable band, um, although those surgeries are being done less. And a uh, requirement is always that um, the patient has, has participated in appropriate lifestyle modifications. This shows the currently available um, bariatric surgery procedures. And uh, for the sake of time, I'm really just going to briefly mention um, a few points. And some of the important takeaways, I think, are that bariatric surgery should not be considered a last-ditch effort or a failure. And patients often wonder about that, or um, patients, friends, and family think that. Um, it's also not a silver bullet. Um, the American Diabetes Association in the 2020 Standards of Care does recommend um, gastric bypass as a treatment for um, type 2 diabetes. It's also important to remember that um, post-surgical weight regain is not a failure. It's more evidence that this is a complex chronic illness. And there have been um, a change in thinking uh, more recently with looking at the use of medications after um, bariatric surgery and the people are recommending that medication use be considered sooner than previously. So it used to be that we would wait until somebody started to regain weight. And now the recommendation is that you should consider restarting medications um, at the time of plateau, again, rather than waiting for that um, regain. The medications that have been have data supporting their use after surgery right now include topiramate, phentermine, and liraglutide. Um, there's also some evidence supporting use of canaglifosin in uh, diabetic patients who've had bariatric surgery. Very briefly to mention the available endoscopic procedures. Um, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail here. Um, key points are that uh, patients may qualify at lower body mass index, so above 30. The three main options are uh, intragastric balloons. The Obera here is one of those. There are other options. There's the endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty, which differs from the laparoscopic um, in that it is a, mostly in that it is a reversible procedure, um, less invasive. Um, fairly similar effectiveness. And then lastly, um, there is uh, aspiration therapy. I wanted to um, finish by mentioning some of the um, available uh, bariatric treatments, the services that are available through WashU. Um, we have our uh, medical weight management clinic, um, which is basically my clinic. And essentially, we're happy to see any patient for any degree of uh, needed or desired weight loss. Um, we give a comprehensive evaluation of all contributing factors. Often I will um, uh, at least temporarily sort of take over management of associated comorbidities like diabetes. Um, and we do diagnose and treat uh, binge eating disorder. 
the weight management program, when you look at the um, recommendations of the um, Obesity Society, the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association for management of obesity, they specifically recommend a medically supervised high intensity comprehensive lifestyle intervention when possible. And that is what we offer at in our program. The important things, key points are that um, everyone starts out with a medical evaluation, a one-on-one -on -one psychological evaluation. Everyone has a one-on-one uh, -on -one session with a registered dietitian to come up with their individual meal plan, most often involving some degree of meal replacements. And then we are in the process of incorporating um, a formal physical therapy evaluation in that initial um, screening. And the key things that I'll just mention, um, it's based on group sessions. Um, currently, these are being done virtually. Um, one of the important things is that um, you can see here the different stages. And um, an important thing is that once people start to lose weight, there's focus on maintenance and looking at the um, what's necessary for you to maintain weight after a loss. So we don't just have you lose weight and then cut you loose. Um, the last thing I'll mention is we are in the process of incorporating an online platform both to the weight management program and to my clinic to uh, which will offer additional monitoring and support and we're hoping that may allow us to restart a stage three which was a long term uh, support. Very briefly, um, this is how you refer to the various uh, weight management and uh, bariatric surgery and endoscopy programs. Um, I'll say that in general, um, if you have someone who's not sure what they want to do, a referral to the medical weight management clinic is usually a good initial step, and I can help figure out um, what of these options may be most appropriate. And I'm going to stop now and end with a picture of my uh, dog, Mia, who we are pretty sure um, shares the uh, POMC mutation that's common in a lot of labs and is responsible for her frequently breaking into the freezer and stealing food whenever she can. So I will stop there and take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Reeds, for that comprehensive overview. Um, we have a couple questions that have come in. Um, we can start with those. Everyone else can feel free to put some questions into the chat or the Q&A. Um, the first one is um, asking about the difference in weight loss seen with loraglutide in that recent semaglutide trial that was published that you went over. Do you think this is a class effect or a true difference between one GLP-1 agonist versus another, or is this just a question of the dose? Um, I think both of those are true. I think it, you know, as you saw from the one data comparing the GLPs, they all have benefit as weight loss, you know, as far as weight loss goes. Um, so I do think it's a class effect, but again, it's largely dose dependent. Um, and you can see that, you know, again, as far as the um, liraglutide goes, is that um, there, it's available as Victoza for treating diabetes as to uh, going up to a dose of 1.8 milligrams daily, as opposed to the um, obesity treatment dose for a Sixenda, that's three milligrams. Got it. Uh, um, Ozempic and whatever the new form of semaglutide, whatever it will be called for the 2.4 is gonna will likely fall into the same um, category. Okay, great. Um, we have another question that came in um, from a geriatrician. Um, so he is curious um, as to the opinion on the alleged obesity paradox shown in some studies that indicates reduced mortality in obese older adults. So do you see a lot of patients in your clinic that are, you know, of the geriatric age and would that their age change their management? Um, I do see um, some geriatric patients. It's a fairly small proportion right now of my patient population. And um, the uh, treatment, really, the main differences are, obviously, there may be some limitations in some of the, the medications that we can use based on comorbidities and other medications that they may be taken. Um, also, our, our goals may be different in someone who's, you know, 75 years old as opposed to someone who's 30 years old as far as how aggressive we um, want to be. Okay, got it. Um, and then the last question here. So it's asking about this um, app called Noom, which I've kind of heard a lot about as well through either TV ads or talking to patients. Um, how does that compare to the behavioral approaches that you discussed? And have you seen patients use this um, resource? 
I've actually had a um, number of patients who've used it and also have some uh, friends who have used it. And in general, um, people really like it. And I think the, you know, the, the most important thing with it is that it, um, it keeps you accountable and, um, you know, offers just by, again, I think a big, the major benefit from the, um, uh, the major benefit from tracking your food is just the accountability and the awareness that comes from it. Um, I'm not fully familiar with all of what it does, but um, as far as the different prompts it gives you, but I do know that um, a lot of people find it very, very helpful. Um, and then um, we have a question about how much weight loss can be expected with an SGLT2 inhibitor? Um, so I can look, I don't know if I can share my screen yeah, again. I have a time to share your screen again, if you'd like, we can always get the QR codes back up there. I have a slide that looks at some of the um, weight loss with the non um, officially FDA approved medications that I can pull up if that's okay. Go ahead. Sorry, I gotta find it back down at the end here. Nope, that's not it. Here we go. So this gives you some idea. So um, here, the one they looked at was um, canagliflozin, and so here there was a at two years there was a uh, three percent uh, loss in excess of placebo. Can you, you said 2% loss? Um, 3%. 3%. Okay. And three years. Awesome. Um, those are all the questions I've seen come through at this point. Thank you so much again, Dr. Reeds, for going through that comprehensive overview of all the services that are offered through the weight management program and a lot of kind of exciting things um, down the line, but we'll, we'll kind of have to see how, you know, acquiring those for our patients goes. Um, thank you again. If anyone has any questions, feel free. You can continue to put them in the chat or the question and we can follow up with you. Great. Thank you very much.